Hello, my name is Gary Mansfield and this is the Ministry of Arts podcast where each week I'll be speaking to a different artist. Now let's begin by bagging these bongos. Hello and welcome to episode 258 of the Ministry of Arts podcast. Firstly as ever, thank you to our Patreon supporters and those of you who have purchased from our merch store, um, both of which you can find out more in the message at the end of this podcast. And also just a little reminder, if you could leave a little review wherever you listen to this podcast, that would really help us grow. That said, to this week's guest, which is photographer Tom Hunter. Tom is one of the many artists who wrote to me while I was in prison back in the 90s, all of whom I am eternally grateful, as they all helped me turn from what I was then to what I am now, (laughs) whatever that may be. Please do go over to Tom's Instagram profile while you're listening to this episode, which is Tom Hunter Photography. When I first saw Tom's work, there was two projects that really warmed my heart and even when I see the images of them now, they still have that effect on me because they're just full of compassion, empathy and a sense of community. The first was Persons Unknown, which has echoes of Vermeer. It's a young lady with a baby standing in front of a window reading an eviction notice. And I should add, these weren't staged. These were actually capturing the moment. This young mum was actually being evicted. The whole street were. Oh, and I should add, that was in uh, the London Borough of Hackney, where Tom has lived for all of his adult life. The other, also in Hackney, was the Holly Street Tower block. Just as emotive, Tom set up his camera in the same place, in the same room of dozens of the flats of the tower block, which was due to be demolished. He wanted to give this high-rise community a bit of worth, something that the local council definitely wasn't doing at the time, with these families being dispersed across London and beyond. And I must say, out of the over 250 episodes that I've recorded, half a dozen or so have really embedded themselves into my heart, and I've got to say, this was most definitely one of them. In this episode, we also talk about Tom growing up in Dorset, with his lifelong friend and club scene legend Adamski, as well as his admiration for Jeremy Della, who, I should add, we will be speaking to later on in the year. So I think that is more than enough from me, so please come along with me and let me introduce you to Tom Hunter. Oh, hello mate, how are you? I'm good, yeah, I'm good, thank you, how are you? Not bad, good to see you. And you, mate. Look like you've got a little halo behind you there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah he has good. risen. <laughs> Excellent. Good to see you, mate. Thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. No, and uh, and thank you for uh, replying to me while I was away all those many moons ago. Yeah, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? It was, wasn't it? Time. Do you remember it? I remember writing, yeah. When was it? Was it ninety? It's in the nineties, wasn't it? It was. It would have been ninety-seven, ninety-eight. Yeah. You was doing at the time the tower block, which is okay. the one that that got me. Yeah. That um yeah made me write to you at the time. I know that was a a couple of decades ago. But how you been? What you've been up to since? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hanging around. Doing Where business. are you? Where's Where's home at the moment? I'm um, still in Hackney. Oh, um, you are nice. Yeah. Good. So yeah, I haven't moved more than um more than a hundred yards in forty years. <laughs> Excellent. About fifteen different places, but no more than a hundred yards. So one of the roads off London Fields. Yeah. yeah. Excellent yeah. stuff. Yeah. I was properly thrown when uh, Nana mentioned about she was good friends with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you know Nana? Ed. Bought an artwork off me a while ago, oh, okay. a, couple, a couple of years ago. Yeah, she, yeah. She mentioned you, and 
could you? Yeah. Ask Tommy if he'll come on. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I've been friends with Adam for about 50 odd years. Oh, that long? <laughs> what, you grew up yeah. together? One of my best mates was his best mate, but not in the same town. My parents used to take us to this town um, and uh, his their, their children were hanging around with him. So every time we went and stayed with my mate, I would see Adam. And then he moved to Hackney the same time as I moved to Hackney. There you go. So, uh, yeah. And that was, yeah, four odd years ago. So we've been friends, yeah, ever since, yeah. Excellent stuff. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I should add, um, because this is an, an audio thing, that um, the Adam that we're talking about is Adamski, choreographer of many a, many a good tune, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly, yeah, um, brilliant, yeah, brilliant. I asked... I asked several questions in this recording, Tom, that yeah. but the, the first one is, how would you explain what you do to someone that may not know your work? Yeah, yeah, it's quite hard, really. Um, I do projects, um, uh, mostly in photography and film. So, yeah, yeah, to come up with a short explanation is quite tricky, but uh, I suppose I do projects around, about the people who, that I live around, in my local neighbourhood of Hackney. So I've made a tower block, a 3D photographic model, or tower block in Hackney where I was living and came up for demolition. I made a, a 3D photographic model of the street I was squatted in in Hackney. Um, and I've done lots of photographic projects about the people around me and I live with. Some of it's quite political. Um, some of it's based on artworks. Um, but I suppose it's project-based photography, um, talking about my environment and the people around me. But sorry, I'm not very succinct, but yeah. yeah. Um, my first introduction to you was, as we just mentioned, the Holly Street Tower Block project. And I mentioned this to Nana when I recorded with her. I wasn't creative as a child, although the connection I got with your Tower Block work, which was... For the list, I mean, I'll let you go into more detail, obviously, but um, in the same room of a tower block, but in different flats. So you would have the same room layout, but different decoration and different people sitting in it. And when I was a child, we lived in a block of flats and I would go up to friends' flats as you did, you know, as a, as a kid. And it always caught me out. It was always exactly the same, but very different, you know. Yeah, and I got those feelings come rushing back to me when I when I saw your work. But how did that come about, Tom? Um, I suppose, well, yeah, initially I, I, I'd made a model of a, of a street, of the street we're squatting in, which was due for demolition. So I wanted to document that before it was destroyed. Um, and that got a bit of attention. It went into the Guardian and a few things. And it got bought by the Museum of London. And about a year later... There was a local charity called the Hackney Building um, Exploratory set up in Queensbridge Road in a school. And they said, would I like to do another project, make another mod of the street? And I said, well, actually, I've got a few friends who live in this tower block on Holly Street Estate, and that's been blown up. And actually, at the time, I think there were like 30 odd tower blocks being blown up around Hackney. They were trying to change Hackney, the council. The whole country was trying to change. Yeah. Um, and they thought social housing was bad. Um, and if you blew up the tower blocks, put everyone in low level housing, everyone would be a lot happier, which I thought was really ironic because 20 years before that, they were clearing all the back to back <laughs> exactly. houses. And they were saying, if you clear people out of these back to back terrace houses, which are now worth millions, yeah, yeah. you'd be really happy because they'd be living in the yeah, air. Fun, funny that, isn't it? Yeah. So they built these factory built homes. They didn't maintain them. The government starved them of money, the councils, no concierge on the doors. And the places became pretty run down. But at the same time, the people who lived in these places, you know, they were they were human beings and they made homes in these factory built blocks. So I really wanted to make a document showing the humanity of the people that lived there um, before it was destroyed. But also, you know, say, you know, these aren't squalid, horrible, rat infested dumps. These are these are people's homes and they're yeah. proud of where they live. So um, I spent about two years on that estate, um, knocking on the doors, going up and down those stairs, up and down those lifts, 
lifts breaking down, <laughs> all the stuff that's going on. It was quite a slog. Um, and I got to know a lot of great people. And they were all proud of their homes. They weren't proud of the estate because it was it was being run down. It was due yeah. for demolition. And then I took a picture from the same, same viewpoint, like you said, everyone from the window looking into the flat. And they all had the same layout. But, you know, the Afro-Caribbean flats were incredible, you know, quite wild carpets, beautiful pictures. Then you go into a Muslim home and it was very austere. Then a white working class family. Everyone had a very different take on how a home should look. But they were all very beautiful and they all had their own character. And it was really great to explore that. And I was incredibly fortunate that all these people let me into their homes, let me into their lives. Brilliant. And shared that moment. Um, and I worked with this big old camera, large format camera. So it uses sheet film, five inches by four inches. Wow. And with that, you get a Polaroid back on it. So I set this camera up, I get them to sit down, and I take the picture with a Polaroid, and I show the people what I was doing. So it was, I felt like I was really working in collaboration. It wasn't me sneaking in there, trying to catch these people out and yeah. trying to catch, you know, the dirt and the squalor and saying how bad it was. I was trying to, so when they, you know, the guy was sitting down, the mum was sitting down, and you know, it's like we sit down and watch the TV, and like, <laughs> yeah. the team comes down, and you look a bit of a mess. Uh, you know, I'll show these pictures and say, come on, let's, we're going to show these pictures to the world before this is destroyed. Yeah. Nice. Um, let's have, make something we're proud of and show, you know, show your decent people. So it was a big collaboration. I felt like a portrait painter, really. So I I amassed all these pictures. Um, I think I did nearly 100 portraits in the end because there was four tower blocks all in a row, um, 19 floors on each tower block. And I think there's six flats on each floor. I can't, I'm no, no good at maths, but there's a lot of people. A lot, yeah. <laughs> uh, it comes to quite a few. It does. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people's homes. And then um, I displayed those in the tower block in the top floor of the tower block on the 19th floor, and I printed them floor to ceiling high. And wow, I didn't whole, know that. Yeah, a whole wall of the tower block before it was blown up. And then we got the kids on the estate, we gave them disposable cameras, and they took pictures of their homes in another flat on the 19th Excellent floor. Excellent job. Rachel White really took some pictures of tower blocks being blown up on different estates around Hackney. Um, there was a lovely old well, lady. In, in collaboration, Tom, or was it a separate... That was a separate project. Yeah. Um, there was an old lady to be found who'd been taking pictures on the Holly Street estate before the tower blocks went up. So it was all low rise terraced houses. So we put those up in another flat. Um, so there were four exhibitions in four flats. Then we had another flat with my mate. It wasn't Adam, but it was another <laughs> mate. <laughs> oh, it was Adam actually. <laughs> it was another, Adam. <laughs> another Adam DJ. <laughs> Um, in another flat and we had a party um, and that's when I first showed those pictures and actually Sarchi came and saw that show and he actually bought those pictures that was quite a, a big thing for me it was a thing called the Shoreditch Biennale which was this quite strange photography show in Shoreditch and there's that time when Shoreditch was really rough really run yeah, down yeah. you know there was probably the, the Carpenter's Arms was there the Bricklayers yeah. There's like one or two pubs, no nightclubs, really. Um, so it's a very different place. Um, so when I showed these pictures, people came up from Shoreditch in a coach, went on to the estate, and they were, yeah, people had pissed in the lift. They had to come up to the 19th floor, had to go through the steel doors, and then they experienced these pictures in situ. So it was one of the best things that I'd ever done as, a, as an artist. You know, really showed that the humanity of these people before it was all ripped down and destroyed. Um, and then after that, it was quite a big project. I spent, um, I worked with a guy called James McKinnon, a model maker, and we spent a year putting those pictures into a model, which is about eight foot tall by about four and a half foot wide, five foot wide by about three foot deep. Um, and we made a model of it. And then didn't that. didn't realise that, Tom. Yeah. I didn't know that. Ah, so it just ended yesterday, no, Saturday. I've had it on display now for nine months at the Hackney Museum, and I'm just going to take it down next week or the week after. If you want to come into Hackney, have a sneak preview, but it's still up. You're welcome to come and have a look. And then um, I'm taking it all down, and I've just uh, 
just uh, agreed that the Museum of London is going to take it. So they're going to open it in their new museum in uh, Smithfields when it opens. Brilliant. I had it, I've been displaying it and showing it at different places. It was in the um, Hatley Building Exploratory for about 10 years or so. The model of the tower block now is older than the tower block. <laughs> Built the tower block in 99 and Brilliant. it's 25 years old. The tower blocks were built in 1970 something. They only lasted till, yeah, um, yeah. They only lasted 24 years. Wow. So the tower block has actually lasted longer than the there you go. which is crazy. And the whole idea was like you became like King Kong. So you sort of you looked inside the tower block, and I've got transparencies, five by four inches transparencies. Yeah. In the windows, they're lit from behind, and you look into these people's homes and their lives. So I've got all these windows all backlit and I built the balconies. I've done the graffiti on the bottom of the graffiti that's around at the time. I've got a burnt out car in front of the tower block, which was there. And I put the, the graffiti on it, which is Welcome to Hackney, which was one of the uh, one of the quite famous bits of uh, graffiti. As you drove into Hackney, there's always a burnt out car which said Welcome to Hackney. <laughs> there was a book called Ship Places to Live in England or Ship Places, yeah. Ship Britain or something. And Hackney was always number one. And that was always the main image, was this burnt out car with Welcome to Hackney. <laughs> so I've incorporated the sort of brutality of that, yeah. that tower block. But then you look inside and you see the humanity of how people's made their lives and brought up families and yeah, lived, lived incredible lives there. Um, it was, it was quite a long a, project. It, it got me at the time. You could just feel the compassion and empathy that you were showing. And you knew that outside where I grew up in Dagenham in a block of flats outside was exactly as you said. Um, but inside it was, you know, it was your little bit of treasure, you know, that's right, your domain. You locked that door and you were safe in your home and you made it safe and warm, comfortable, great place for kids growing up, affordable rents, and you could get on with your lives. Yeah, really important. Yeah, you could you could see that the pride in some of the people that were that were sat there in their in their sort of Sunday best, if you like, you know, in, in their front room. And you could see that everyone had nothing, but they rejoiced what they did have. You know, there was a big sense of community there. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. On Saturday, when we closed the show, um, a few of the residents came down. Um, they were talking about the old days and what it was like, the community. And this was uh, a guy who's probably our age and uh, proper East End. I said, ah, oh, the community down there at the time. And uh, he was talking about it. And then, uh, yeah, my dad was this Jewish Jewish lawyer defending everyone. And it was, yeah. And, and don't hear nothing like that anymore. You don't hear the voices like that around you anymore. And it's quite incredible how much it's changed as well. I mean, yeah. it's, it is better in lots of ways, you know. The schools are better. It's safer. But, you know, cheap housing, you know. When my kids, my kids are of a certain age now, they're leaving school, they can't afford, they would never better yeah. afford to live around here. And that's a real shame that people are being forced out now, the working class and the people who haven't got the money can be forced out of this vibrant great diverse areas that's a real shame but i think tom it, i think it goes in waves anyway you know or well, they they beat, built the tower blocks in the early 60s because it was a better way of living then they pulled them down because it didn't work but you look in london now and there's tower blocks going up everywhere yeah. all right it's not for the the likes of us it's for the for the people that have um they're yeah. holding a few quid anyway and of you know international investors and whatnot um so it's a different type of block of flat but it's still the same issues there's still like little cellular apartments where you don't really get the opportunity to speak to your neighbors yeah it, it is a bit sad that yeah yeah very um yeah disparate living disparate living yeah yeah was it from there that persons unknown was established was it from actually, that block the other way round? Yeah. Oh, was it? Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, Persons Unknown was actually, that was uh, about a couple of years before that. That was actually, I went to the Royal College of Art and that was my graduation project when I was there. Was it really? Uh, yeah. That was amazing. It, oh, thank I, you. I mean, I, you know, it's 25 plus years ago, but yeah, yeah. I mean, what a thing that was. What yeah. a thing. Yeah, it was it was quite uh 
it was yeah it felt like a big deal at the time um and again it was, it was all down to it was all down to my friendships really you know i lived i was i've been living in in hackney by that point for about 10 years or so a bit more than 10 years maybe 15 years um and i'd ended up living on the street on any fort road which was all squatted we all over the years uh the whole part of the east side of london fields was designated an industrial area which means that the council were compulsory buying all the houses um with the idea to knock them all down and then build industrial units there so all these amazing terrace streets and there were loads of them Ellingfort road london lane Granson avenue they were knocking bits down and they were buying them but then they couldn't do it so it's all really slow yeah, but yeah. when they bought it, they evicted a working class family, and we would know them, and then they would call us up or knock around our house because they knew us. And they say, "Oh, we're being evicted on Monday. We're moving out to yeah, Leighton or Wanstead or further yeah, out. Yeah. Why don't you come and take over the house?" And they give us the keys, and then one by one, we yeah. actually got the whole street. You know, and there was about <laughs> 120 of us squatting there in the end, Excellent. two streets back to back. So I got to know this incredible community of people and they were all different types. You know, there were carpenters, dispatch riders, students, nurses, doctors, you name it, they lived there. And then the council did get their, their act together and they wanted to evict us all to build these industrial light units. I really wanted to document it before it was all gone. And then for some reason, I thought, actually, I want to do something which relates to fine art and painting and I want to give my sitters a bit of status and I want to raise their status because normally when you see pictures of squatters or people living in tower blocks it's quite black and white it's quite yeah, it's the detrimental the side of it yeah yeah it's in the mirror or it's in the tabloids you know scumbags destroying property which is fair enough um, but I wanted to show that we've taken over property which was left derelict we had recycled it we were looking after it and we created a community. So I based all my photographs on Vermeer paintings, you know, small town in Delft. And by doing that and giving these, giving my neighbours a chance to enact the postures and poses of these paintings and then making these prints quite big, five foot by four foot prints, suddenly all my friends who were just ordinary squatters suddenly looked quite regal and quite fancy. They looked like yeah, members of royalty almost. Yeah, yeah. So everyone was like, wow, what's going on here? And it really took the media and the sort of the sort of zeitgeist by storm, really. If I can just butt in there, Tom, it, yeah. it doesn't take much to give people a bit of self-pride, does it? No, exactly. It's only yeah. got to take someone to show us a little bit of our worth and then we sort of polish that little bit and, yeah, it's it's a beautiful thing. Sorry. No, you're totally right. And, and my, I used to teach and students used to say, well, I don't like going up to people, you know, and asking people, can I take your picture? It feels a bit imposing. And actually I said, well, actually, it's a real, it's a real honour. Yeah. I don't want to go, can I, can I make a picture with you? So when I was talking to my neighbours, I would go around with my Vermeer book and said, I'm doing this crazy project and I would let you look great. And I think you would look brilliant in this posture. They were like, oh, well, Someone's taking notice of me. Yeah. Someone wants to use my image and someone wants to work with me. And they saw it as a as a as a privilege. Um, and for me, working with them was a such a privilege as well. So it was a real collaboration. Um, and it was a real joy to work with all my friends. And they were so proud to be part of that. And they still come, you know, all the exhibitions I have, if they're in London or if anywhere else, actually. They always come to. So I had that opening in um, the Hackney Museum in September. And it's great. I always know I'm going to get a, a room full of people. The whole place is always packed out, mainly because I give them free drink. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but they always but come. Either way, yeah. And we're sharing it. You know, we share in our history. We share of what we've achieved by saving these houses. We share of the work we've done. It's because I've all I've done is I've pressed a button. But they've had to do the posing. They've had to sit there. They've had to invest their time and effort within these works. So it's a real celebration of what we've where we've come from and what we've done and our history and yeah, our shared heritage. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I did butt in at a crucial point, but you you had them stood in front of a window with the light shining through, and they was the reading of an eviction notice. And um, it, it's timeless, isn't it? Yeah, it, it seems to be. I mean, it's funny, I didn't see it like that at the time, you know. No, of course not. It was in the moment. You do but, this picture and, yeah. But and when you got... you, even when you look at that now, it could be yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my one of my best friends, Philippa, and her daughter Saskia, and she, I'm still great friends with Philippa. She still comes and visits me, and I visit her. And, and to have that to share as well, and to have that picture in my house, and to see her is is lovely for me to have these pictures and these memories of these people. And when I took these pictures, you know, I did think it was like that. It thought it'd be like me sharing memories with my friends before we all got evicted, and we we're all dispersed, and then uh, you know. All the squatters will think they're funny pictures, but how would that relate to other people who aren't squatting? But what I realised was that actually it sort of struck a lot of people because a lot of people have to move out of rental accommodation. A lot of people have had a situation where they can't pay their mortgage. A lot of people have to move out for whatever reason. It's one of the most traumatic things that could ever happen to you is, yeah. is moving for whatever reason. Even if you want to move, it's a traumatic experience moving from one property to the next, one home to the next. So I think the empathy, because it was well so well taken, as in that you, you build up a relationship with Philippa and her baby, and the baby's there, and you see that connection between the mother and the daughter, that I think there's empathy and there's a sense of connection and and humanity as well, which really is timeless, like you say. Um, and it really worked on so many levels, which I could never have anticipated when I took that picture. But now, you know, as my, as my show closed on Saturday in the Hackney Museum, another show opened in Tasmania, in the Museum of the Old and New Art, in this huge museum in Holbert. And that's one of the main pictures on the wall there, next oh, yeah. to a Renoir, a Picasso, and all these great masters, which is... Totally mind blowing, you know. Yeah, you, you I mean, never you, think of that in a million years when you're you're taking a snap of your mate in their bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> you did say there, though, Tom, about the empathy being in the image. It's not something you can put into an image. No, you no, know, it's not a filter. It's it's present in the room. It's a you know, it's a, it's an empowering presence. You can't just add it to it. So it only works because you had that attitude towards the people that you were working with. You know. Yeah, and that friendship, that camaraderie, you know. Um, and I did say to the people, we can use these pictures and we can sort of use this in the media to sort of have a campaign to try and save our houses. But, yeah, th that picture comes from, you know, she was a really good friend. And all those pictures come from great friendships. Yeah, That camaraderie where we're sharing, there's a trust, there's an understanding, and they know I want to do good by them and they want to do good by me. So that makes us all feel good about the whole thing. There's no exploitation. Um, or if there is, I'm exploited. I'm using her image, but the way she wants it to be used. Um, and she's using her image to to say, you know, this is my home, this is my baby, and she's proud of it. So it's in the best pot of best possible sense of of using something, using photography to do some good in the world. So yeah, it's, it's it was an incredibly proud moment. It still is for us all, yeah. You've obviously got a lot of empathy and sense of community in your work. Growing up, Tom, um, did you have creativity in the home growing up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's quite funny. I, I, I grew up in a very small village, you know, a um, hundred miles away from London um, in a small village in Dorset. So things it seems sounds very different than the Hackney experience. But funny enough, that small village, everyone was pretty much working in that village and living in that village. All the kids were local kids. And it was a credible sense of camaraderie and sharing. You know, at the age of 12, we were all working at local farms all summer. Um, we all left school at 16, 15. We all worked together doing jobs. Everyone shared everything. Um, we had one pub we all went to. So funny enough, when I went to Hackney and saw, squatted in that street, it just felt like a little village, really. But yeah. London Fields, our little cricket ground, a local pub, um, pub on the park. It was all felt quite similar in a way. Um, it's almost like I was trying to create a village in Hackney, and Hackney is a village anyway. And I suppose Hackney back then as well had no tube, 
the overground wasn't really there. They, you know, no, no. You get like a couple of trains an hour to Hackney Central. Nothing stopped at London Fields. People made their own entertainment in Hackney then. The pubs were all very busy. And that's where it was I mean, all London fun. Fields, Tom, if I can butt in there, someone from outside of London, or albeit just down the road, really, but when you'd go up into that bit of Hackney, I mean, the major bit of Hackney was what we used to call in the 80s like a no-go bit, you know, there were certain bits. But Hackney Fields always seemed that bit that was like in between Essex and London, you know, it had a, it had a different sort of atmosphere. Yeah, it was quite special, I think. I, I don't know why that was. But, um, and it has it's still got that a... village feel now, though, mate, hasn't it? It still yeah, has, yeah. On that little, where the roundabout is, where, where you said about the... Yeah, pub in the park, yeah. Right, that where, all around that little area there, that's still got that little villagey vibe. It has, yeah. Sorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, growing up, my dad actually, he built a darkroom in the backyard. Um, he made this sort of shed thing and he built a darkroom in there. Um, he was really into photography. He had an old Pentax 35mm camera. And I think it's about 11, well probably 13, 11 or 12, 13, something like that, early teens. That uh, He took me in, you know, you had to go around this corner, around this corner, around that corner, <laughs> the red light. Yeah, yeah. Put me into this little weird space, put in the, uh, you know, your um, negative in the uh, larger, shine the light through under the paper, put it in this weird tray with this chemical in it, swishing it around. And then I remember my sister's face coming out of this water, this liquid. And this picture I took of my, my sister, Vicky, in our garden. Thought, wow, this is incredible. And it's a bit like sort of like magic, isn't it? Exactly. It's, like, yeah. it's magic. It's like, wow, is this like a witch is making a magic potion or is it, you're making this amazing image? So, yeah, my dad was pretty creative in that sort of sense. Um, and my mum was always doing paintings. She's she's blind now, pretty much. Oh, wow. Um, okay. But... She's still painting and making Brilliant. collages. She has to get about this close. <laughs> all into it. Yeah. She's still making Always it. Always got oil paint on the end of her nose. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was quite lucky. It was quite strange in my village because everyone else was literally farm workers. Yeah. Um, and Actually, my dad was a farm worker and a, and a builder by trade, carpenter by trade. But uh, there was that bit going on, which I didn't tap into. I left school at 15, worked for the Forestry Commission, cutting down trees every day, putting up fences. And it wasn't until I escaped to Hackney, I had a girlfriend who moved to Hackney to go to college, that I came up and then I started meeting all these strange people. Um, Adamski was up there at the time, he'd moved over the year before me, and he was living in a squat. Um, and all these strange people were living up there doing all these weird things, making music, making art, making all sorts of things. It's like, wow. So even though when I came up to London, I actually got a job in uh, Regent's Park as a tree surgeon because that's the only thing I could use as a train yeah. store. But um, I started to meet all these weird and wacky people and I thought, okay, maybe I could do something a bit more interesting than uh, chopping off branches on trees. <laughs> <laughs> so was it a bit of a culture shock coming from a small village to a big city? I, I know you said that London Fields had that village vibe. Yeah. But it, either way, it's not a village out in the country, is it? It ain't, no, no. No, it's, it's, it was a huge culture shock, massive culture shock, but massively fucking exciting, so exciting. Yeah, I can uh, imagine. Yeah, just, you know, I, we have one pub in our village, um, and if you wanted to go out, you, know, you had to travel. If you want to see a band, you had to go a long way away to see, you know, go to Bournemouth or Poole. Yeah. It was all about travelling, and then it's really hard to find people to go out with. And then suddenly in Hackney, Everyone's doing so. There's stuff Still within on. arm's reach, yeah. Yeah. Everything's really close. There were so many people like-minded, you know, bands and music and raves and so much going on. And then people for living in Spain and Italy and France, America, South America. It's like, wow, where are you from? Wow, where are you from? Where are you from? <laughs> Everything really? exploded, really. It was in, in such an amazing cultural way, as in just people just doing crazy things. And then when we... When I got into the squatting, you were just meeting more and more people all the time. Um, we used to go to one pub called the Samuel Peeps, which was next to the Hackney Empire, where they had all these bands playing all the time. Just, yeah, small punk bands and yeah, yeah. things. It was mobbed out every Saturday night. 
and it closed at one o'clock and everyone sort of word of mouth knew where the party would be and it'd be in some warehouse or some old big house which just squatted and literally you just meet you'd meet people all the time all doing so yeah it was it was an amazing time actually it felt like it was one big playground for if you were young and stupid enough you could have a great time <laughs> freedom and creativity is a good yeah. thing to get together eh yeah amazing yeah. yeah it's a thing that most of us are still searching for now yeah totally yeah yeah it's hard to do and um yeah i think we're quite lucky because you know you didn't need a lot of money then obviously those houses were just left empty so we weren't paying rent i was actually working on working at brick lane market at that point so i was buying brick back from jumbo sales and selling it on brick lane on a fly <laughs> yeah. pitch on the sunday morning and that would keep me going for a week and then i could buy a bit of film take a few snaps go to parties hang out with people making music. So it, it was a great time. So at what point, Tom, did you want to take the photography seriously or see it as something that was a, a viable route? I think, well, yeah, everyone says I'm dyslexic. I've, I've never done a um, one of these tests. But uh, if you ever get an email from me, everyone says you've never got an email from me or a text message from me. <laughs> <laughs> say, oh, of course you're thinking dyslexic. <laughs> I always miss out words and letters and but I can't spell to save my life. But I can read. I do enjoy reading. When I've been in London for a couple of years, I thought, oh, yeah, it'd be nice to do something different. So I started um, an A-level uh, part-time course in photography. And, uh, yeah, that's what led me to it. So I was in the dark room, printing my own stuff, taking pictures. I was doing stuff on Brick Lane. And I was just incredibly lucky that tutors said, this is good. You could go further with this. I don't, I don't think there was much luck there, really, was there? They weren't <laughs> they looking at luck. Or who, yeah. Who, who supported me and pushed me on to do the next thing. Because um, I just thought I'd do an A-level course, learn the basics. I was living in a nice, in a nice squat then on Richmond Road, just literally at the end of this road. And uh, we had a big basement, which was all derelict. You know, the floorboards had been ripped up and it was plastered falling off. But I thought I'd lay a floor in there um do yeah get some get something up on the walls and start up a little studio and do portraits of people but when I did the A-level my tutor at the time said yeah what well, you should apply to do a degree and I said well I've got no qualifications and they said oh you're mature now you're 25 you don't need that anymore you can get in your portfolio so that led me to London College of Printing and then the tutors there I, I made the model of the squatted street I was living in when I was squatting there. And yeah, it just one step just kept on. You only go as far as one person lets you go, really. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was at school, everyone said I was thick and you don't do exams and you need to leave school, you need to get a job. So that's what I did. But then as soon as I started taking up photography, people said, oh, you need to do the next thing. Yeah. So, okay. And then you do the next thing and then, okay, do the next thing. And then, oh, you need to have an exhibition. And then, okay. You need to do, a, why don't you do some pictures for the, the Observer or why don't you do some pictures for wherever it is. So one thing just led on. Yeah, and I was just incredibly, yeah, lucky. Or, I well, it's funny, well. Tom, because I, I grew up in a, a same, I say the same environment, with the same attitude. Your view of the future is so fucking short. It's yeah, at yeah, arm's length, think, more or less, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. you don't really see beyond that. It wasn't until... I was at pretty much at university when I was when I was in jail. I don't I don't know how much you you know about my the later end of my sentence, but um, just a, a quick rundown. I was writing to people like yourself who were sending stuff back. I was like taking all that on board. You know, was every person that wrote to me was one of those small little um, pushes that I was getting all the way up to starting a degree. And it wasn't until maybe the second or third year of that degree that I realised it wasn't just what I can create with my mind. Just reaching out and looking a little bit further can can really push you on. But yeah, I'd, I'd never had that, and especially being in a prison cell. You know, the the yeah. views. You know, you couldn't go beyond the wall, really. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, it's incredible what you've done, what you've achieved, and getting out of that situation. Yeah. But, Actually, even when I left my degree course. And I made the model of the street I was squatting on, and that got sold to the Museum of London and put on display. 
even then I was like, oh, I didn't understand it all and ended up ended up buying a double decker bus and um traveling around Europe for two years, basically just living off selling alcohol and veggie burgers and <laughs> But you done you done a project on travellers as well, didn't you? Yeah, I did, yeah. I took loads of 35 mil slides when I was traveling for those two years around Europe, going to raid parties and traveling around with like Spiral Tribe and Bedlam, all these sound systems, putting on free festivals and parties. But I, I just kept them under my bed for like 20 years or something. <laughs> and then someone came to me and said, didn't you do pictures? And I said, oh, yeah. And we dragged them out and we did a book a few years ago about it called The Crowbar, which is the name of... It was Lee Crowbar, not Lee Crowbar, but, you know, was, you know, to make it seem a bit more, not like we're breaking into squat. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was at that time I thought, actually, I want to get back into my art. I want to do that properly. And I really want to make a living rather than... It was fun going around in a bus, but, you know... It's... Yeah, making enough to just put food in your belly doesn't work long term, does it? No, living day to day is quite exciting. But after a couple of years, you really want to do something... To... And it gets a bit dull as well, really, just yet. Yeah. So that's when I applied to go to Royal College of Art. Uh, so I came back from the south of Spain, where we were parked up on site in the south of Spain on this sort of hippie riverbed with loads of crusties, drove back an old Persia estate and got back. And luckily there was a squat still, you know, I had a room still in the squat that someone let, let me stay in. And I started at the Royal College of Art. And uh, yeah, I think that's when... Yeah, people like, you know, Gavin Turk and different artists would come to the college. I don't think the, the actual teaching was pretty rubbish at college, to be quite honest. But what I've always loved when I've been at college is the external people that come in and they do their talks about what they've done in their career and how they've made their work and what they're doing. And that really inspired me. And I thought, yeah, yeah, there is there is a space for all sorts of types of people to do what they want to do and get out there. So, yeah. Well, that's what this is, Tom, to be honest. This podcast was set up, you know, with a load of different ideas of what it's about, but that was one of them. Yeah, it's those, it's the stories that are inspiring. The art is just an extension of our personality, I believe. But, um, yeah, the, the story, their background and, you know, the, the journey they've travelled is is the interesting bit, you yeah. know. And what drives them, yeah. And I'm, I'm still doing that now. I've been just running a film series at my local... Handy Picture House. Nice. And we had uh, Jeremy Della there last night showing a film that he made about uh, Bruce Lacey, who's an Brilliant. artist who had a studio in Hackney. And then we had a film about um, Beck Road, which is another road just off London Fields, which was squatted by artists. And it was uh, Helen Chadwick and Interim Art, and lots of people were living down there. So we had sort of Hackney sort of loving last night, talking about the artists and the chaos, the anarchy and... So that was really good fun. And again, you know, by organising these films, I get to meet Jeremy Della and we did an in conversation at the end of it and it inspires me. I don't know what he thought about it, but, and then we had, you know, we sold over 120 tickets. So it was, well, it was a great night and really, yeah. It's, it's you're really saying you don't know what he thought about it. I mean, I, I was with Jeremy just two weeks ago. I forgot to mention it because I did see on your on your, your Instagram that you've been doing stuff with him. And I yeah. forgot to mention it last night. Oh, that, that's quite right. His attitude to people is very similar to yours. He's all, he's all about, not the, not quite the underdog, but shining a bit of light on, on those that are uh, in the shadows, if you like, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and the way he made this film about um, Bruce Lacey, who's, who should be a huge name in British art, but he's just like, some people have heard of him, some people haven't. But the way he made that film is just, yeah, a great piece of, I don't know, it's just not just a documentary, but you feel as though you're friends with him at the end of it. Yeah. It's really compassionate. It's really humane. And it's a celebration of someone's life. Um, and the same way that he did, you know, the Battle of All Greaves is one of the mm -hmm. best, absolutely brilliant pieces of work, you know, celebrating those people who were basically battered and smashed and oppressed by Thatcher's boot boys at the time, you know, trying to smash the trade unions and and just, yeah, oh, it's horrible. I went through that whole period and, you know, I was working in, in jobs where people would read The Sun and it'd be slagging off Arthur Scargill and the miners yeah, yeah. and slagging off the unions. And these are working class people reading that and, and rich people writing it, trying to smash the unions. It's, 
it's not hard to be influenced by the wrong people, Tom, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Them them yeah. moguls know what they're doing with them old red tops, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And it's so important that we we try and tell a story of our time. Because if you don't tell the story, it doesn't get written down, it's lost forever. The yeah. reason why the Romans and the Greeks are so amazing in the world is because they wrote it all down. Yeah. They wrote their histories, they wrote their philosophies, they wrote the Iliads, they read all these great stories where people in Africa weren't writing it down. It was all oral tradition. Yeah. Probably just as rich and probably just as interesting, but it wasn't written down. So the Greeks managed to put that down. And I sort of compare that with like Hollywood as well. You know, in some ways, Hollywood won the Cold War because Hollywood presented America as this great place with loads of fun, loads of girls, loads of cars, loads of money. The American dream. The American dream. And Russia was wasn't doing that. It was just the Soviet Union was just drab, drab, Cold drab. And gray, yeah. Yeah. And so by by people like Jeremy Deller telling the story of miners, that's that's given them a place within our society where people go, oh, actually they were important rather than, oh, those terrible units. And and by by me making the pictures of squatters or people living in tower blocks, these people are are put on a certain level. They're not just forgotten about. They're not written out of history and they're not sort of just laughed at and, and put in disposable as unhelpful or yeah, lower class. So it's very important that we tell these other stories and it's not just the rich and the famous, you know, the yeah. Tatlers and the Vogues and the the Hello magazines and it's the royal family and pop stars and film stars. Yeah, hats off to you there, Mike. Yeah, we've got to tell other stories as well and there, there's so many stories to be told and we've got to keep at it. Well, speaking of, of other artists... If there was five artists, Tom, past or present, what would your ideal group show be? Ah, um, Velasquez has to be Velasquez. <laughs> I just love those paintings are just sublime. Uh, yeah, I always come back to painting, really. I did go to that Vermeer show in in Amsterdam last year, and that was amazing. So maybe I'll put uh, some of that in there. Um, obviously, you talk about everything that's just happened to you. So I'd probably put one of our Bruce Lacey's robots in there. No, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is all just totally top of my head, so I'm not thinking about it, really. And it'd then, be different uh, next week, wouldn't it? It'd be totally different next week. But I'm just going to go with the ones I'm just influenced by now. And then I'm going to probably go with um, Jeremy Deller, because I was with him last night. And I'll go with his uh, bouncy castle, Stonehenge. You know, I used to go to the Stonehenge Festival for the last three years, because I was brought up in Dorset. So we used to bunk off school hitch up to Avery and then go up to the stones, listen to Hawkwind, trying to avoid the uh, Hell's Angels who are trying to nick our jackets because we were punks. Um, <laughs> and then he's, yeah, now it's all under fences with security guards and I hate Stonehenge, the way it's been dealt with yeah. that way and kept kept all the people out there. But what he did with that, uh, with making that into a fun thing again with that bouncy castle, I tried to um, borrow it for a, a show that we're doing down in uh, Shoreditch um, later this year about Ray, but he said he sold it, so we can't use it. So, so I have a bouncy castle uh, for Mir, um, Velasquez, Bruce Lacey. So I've got one more, haven't I? So what do I, what do I like to see when I'm bouncing on a castle of Stonehenge? I think I'm going to have a film, and I think I'm going to have Apocalypse Now in it as well. Brilliant. Because I think when I'm bouncing... There's that sound of um, who's a composer when those helicopters are going into battle. I don't know, but that's the bit that comes to mind as soon as you said the title of the film. So listening to, I think it's, um, it's not, um, uh, 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 no, I can't remember the name on top of my head. But that, that, that classical music blasting away when Charlie Don't Surf and that colonel's getting his <laughs> boys into that surf beach, yeah. even though they're under attack in those helicopters. And I'm bouncing up and down on that bouncy castle, thinking about the Druids, and then I'm going to quit and look at uh, the Velasquez and the Vermeers. I think that'd be a quite a good show. It sounds pretty good to me, mate. <laughs> it sounds pretty good to me. And the the last one on, on the list of questions that I do have is, what would you like to do if you wasn't an artist? Um... Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I do. So I do fantasize about moving out to the countryside, 
Um, Would it be back to Dorset? Yeah, I do, I do like Dorset. Um, I've got still got my old friends there. Um, but yeah, I've got an old caravan uh, at my mate's place. He's got a little field, um, which I store it at. And I went down there on Friday. I dragged it out of his field. It's been in the field for years. So it's all overgrown. It's got ivy on it and <laughs> grass around it. And I dragged it out of the field and I took it to Stonehenge on Friday night because I'm going to go down there next week. So I'm working there. And I got it to uh, Glastonbury, pulled out the awning. There's a thicking mice nest in there. So there's mouse crap. <laughs> it took me like all day to clean out all this mice shit and get all the rubbish out. Brilliant. Makes you appreciate it a bit more though, right? It does. Yeah, yeah. So it's, <laughs> it'll be fun. Um, so maybe what would I do with the daughter though? I, I don't know. I, 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 different fantasies. Maybe I'll be um, uh, a fisherman or something like that. Maybe I'll do... Um, I'll get uh, uh, mussels, be a mussel, grow mussels on the on the um, on the shore in Dorset, and I have a little boat, and I'll go and put the mussels out the sea. I love being by the sea. That sounds but, uh, pretty idyllic, doesn't it? Yeah, it could be nice. My missus always says, though, you'll be bored shitless within a week." <laughs> yeah. The village you grew up in was that coastal, or was it more inland? It was inland. It was about twelve, ten, about ten miles from the sea. Got you. It's the sort of middle of nowhere. Yeah. It was a proper, it was a proper place where you really had to get out of because there was nothing going on in there at all. It was really, um, I mean, we all had motorbikes from the age of sixteen, so we would be blasting off and causing all sorts of mayhem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that, that having nothing to do just leads to creativity, doesn't it? Yeah, boredom is 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 something that um I think is really undervalued. Um, yeah, my kids haven't got that boredom now because there's always something to play with. There's always a game. There's always people online. There's always something going on. But when I grew up, you know, if there wasn't your mates around, there was nothing to do. So you had yeah. to you had to create something. Well, you if know, it weren't for that or time, making something or I, I would never have become an artist if it wasn't for all that time that I had with nothing else to do. Because yeah. I, you know, I was I was banged up for hours and hours a day. And when I discovered art, and like from, from the point of me discovering it. Finding out I was good at it, which is sort of tantamount to the same thing, and then falling in love with it and wanting to be an artist was within about six weeks. Wow. Maybe maybe, maybe three months top. I know it's quite a, a bit of additional time, but I know that it was a very short time. And then I was just obsessed with it. And, you know, I had I had what I don't have out here, which is time, you know, and, and I, I was just able to sit down absorb myself you know it, it was that quick I even refer to myself sometimes as a born again artist <laughs> because it just it just happened and exploded and you know I was there well there's a charity called the Kersler Arts and they put on an exhibition every year of prison art in the Royal Festival Hall that um yeah I'd I'd, I'd like you to attend just to yeah. see what what these people do you know and it's normally at the end of the year Oh, this year, Jeremy Dell is the, the uh, curator. Oh, brilliant, yeah. So there yeah. you go. Oh, he's he's worked go with them for years. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Jeremy's the curator this year. Year before last was Ai Weiwei, so there's... Um, wow, yeah, big and, name. And I'm, I'm a trustee of it as well, so, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, a, a good thing, a really yeah, good brilliant. thing. That sounds really good. I broke my leg this year on the 2nd of, uh, 2nd of January, because of the start of the year, I broke my leg. Snap the femur and oh bloody hell! So it's quite severe. So I've had lots of a big metal rod in and lots of pins put in, and I spent sort of three months this year not being able to go out, but I've been doing loads of drawing. I was drawing every day, and I got totally into it. And I thought, wow, I could be a quite good artist if I actually had something like that that kept me. <laughs> and photography it has enabled me to interact with the world, to meet people, and to. And to experience my life through other people's worlds, which has been amazing. But I've got quite a lot of energy and I'm always wanting to get out and do that. But um, I suppose the other thing I'd like to do, if I if I could do, would actually be an artist, you know, painting and drawing. Um, and if I could just sit still for long enough, <laughs> that's what I'd really like to do, sit somewhere nice and just do that, yeah. Well, in between harvesting your muscles down on the Dorset coast, <laughs> you, can, you, can, uh, you can have your own little... Um, That's right. dark room at the end of the garden but just yeah a and a little studio do a little drawing <laughs> yeah so what have you got coming up mate yeah I, I don't know what have i got coming up i'm trying to think 
Um, all right, I'm going to Glastonbury on um, on Friday, um, and I've been working with uh, Critical Waste, so they do all the litter picking and recycling. Brilliant, yeah. I know. Um, so I've been doing different projects at Glastonbury now for a few years. So um, I'll be doing pictures with them, and they're quite interesting because um, you know the whole traveller thing is sort of hand in hand with Glastonbury. They've got this sort of itinerant workforce, which is a lot of old travellers. So they've got these fields. So it's like going back to like Stone Age Festival. <laughs> so I'd like to do some more work with some people. You know, I've got friends who've got trucks and buses who go there. And people stay there for like three, four weeks and work there. So I'll be doing some pictures and portraits. And, and also I'll be doing some, yeah, driving to help pick up the rubbish as well. So that's always really good to catch up with people I used to be on the road with and people I've known from the past. So I'll be doing that. And then, um, yeah, I'm doing some landscape stuff about power and power stations and old power stations nice. as that's all disappearing. That sort of stopped when I broke my leg because I didn't travel. And then, um, yeah, I'm going to start some new things in September. I've got a few shows coming up here and there. I'm helping to create a show about Rave in Curtain Road, which will open in October. Yeah, um, yeah. Called Sweet Harmony. So um, hopefully I'm going to get Adam Madamsky down to do some nights there, some play some music i nice. asked jeremy Della to bring his um like i said his um bouncy castle but he sold that and he can't <laughs> put that down which is a shame but I'll probably show his film there's a bloke uh, around the corner from me who, who does bouncy castles for birthday a... parties i can get you one of those <laughs> <laughs> they're all good, they? they good those <laughs> so yeah i've got a few things coming up um good yeah and i still want to make yeah i've done i've made a few films a couple of little films and i want to try and make a few little films as well i quite like making short documentaries which i find really interesting brilliant and how can anyone see what you're doing be it website or social media um tom hunter photography on instagram i use quite a lot i'm on twitter i think it's tom hunter artist maybe on twitter <sighs> um and I, yeah i've yeah i've got quite a few shows coming up i've got a show in tasmania at the moment um i've got a show in sweden coming up this year i've got a show in Germany coming up and I've got a show in Vienna coming up and I've got oh there's a show in Scotland coming up near Edinburgh in September um, and this rave thing in October in Shoreditch Excellent. so there's a few things coming up shows with my work in it good yeah. on you yeah. Tom that's all my questions asked mate thank you very much it was really enjoyable it's great to meet you and, uh, and you mate yeah I'm glad you're not in the place where I sent that letter <laughs> oh, no yeah. I'm in a, a much better place both physically and mentally yeah yeah nice one yeah good yeah. well thank you very much mate I really do appreciate you and and I know I sort of touched on it at the beginning and during that but um I can't thank you enough just for picking up a letter and um replying to that person that you didn't know it, it it still means a lot to me to this day you know Oh, sorry. Well, that means a lot. Still... No, it's really, yeah, it's wonderful to hear because you, you do these things and you never, yeah, you never know the effect, do you? It's like, yeah, yeah well, it's saying to me, yeah, go to college or you know, why don't you enter? I entered my picture of that woman, Philippa, into the uh, National Portrait Award at the National Portrait Gallery. My neighbour said, you should enter that picture. And I did and I won it, you know, just a little conversation with one yeah. person. And that just takes you to another thing, doesn't it? So, yeah, so I know it's a, a small thing to to yourself, but yeah, yeah it meant well, meant well to me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Ministry of Arts podcast. It's a podcast that's produced with the help of the listener, and if you like what you've heard and you think you might be able to give a little support, there's two ways in which you can do it. If you go over to the Ministry of Arts Instagram profile, you'll find a link tree drop down box. And in that box, you'll find two links. One is called Buy Us A Coffee, and it's pretty much that. You can make a one-off payment the price of a cup of coffee. Or, if you're able and want to do it more long-term, you can become a Ministry of Arts Patreon, where you can sign up to support us on a monthly basis. And 100% of your support goes back into the podcast. And if you're not able to do that, that's absolutely fine. This content is free for everyone. But we would urge you to follow us on your socials, and show us a bit of love that way. Either way, thanks for listening, and see you next time. Ta-da.